Hi, my name is Taylor Barfield and I'm the literary manager at Two River Theatre, coming to you from my living room in Red Bank, New Jersey, to talk to you about August Wilson's play, Radio Golf. Radio Golf was the last play that Wilson wrote for his incredible American Century Cycle, which included one play focused on African American life for each decade of the 20th century. It was also the last play that he wrote before his untimely death at the age of 60. Radio Golf first premiered at the Yale Repertory Theater on April 22, 2005, and Wilson passed away on October 2, 2005. He already knew that he was sick during the world premiere production, and he actually refused treatment that could have extended his life in order to finish the play and his cycle. And none of Wilson's plays is as invested in and indebted to the idea of the full cycle as Radio Golf. There are payoffs to plays set almost 100 years in the past, Easter eggs, references to characters only mentioned in the cycle, such as uh, Buddy Will, uh, Sam Green, and Sarah Degree. It's a play with layers. And the more you listen to the words, the richer your experience becomes with not only this story, but the nine stories that came before it. Now, Wilson's plays are deeply engaged with the past, history, how history is chronicled, and how to reestablish a connection to forgotten narratives. One of the things that he said about his work in an early career interview is that he was, quote, trying to focus on what he felt were the most important issues confronting Black Americans for that decade. So ultimately, they could stand as a record of Black experience over the past hundred years presented in the form of dramatic literature. In the first cycle plays that he wrote, Jitney, Ma Rainey, and Fences, he tells stories of those not recognized in the mainstream narrative of American history. Fences and Jitney focus on the lives of people from the neighborhood that Wilson grew up in in Pittsburgh called the Hill District. These plays focus on members of his community that history has forgotten or overlooked altogether, but who lived big lives. Fences focuses on the Maxson family during the 1950s and a bit in the 1960s, and Jitney follows the drivers of a local Jitney station in the 1970s. Ma Rainey is uncharacteristic in the century cycle for a number of reasons, including being the only cycle play that does not take place in the Hill District. That play takes place in Chicago. The play tells the story of Ma Rainey, who was hailed as the mother of the blues in black communities during the early 20th century, but who was largely forgotten in music history before Wilson premiered his play in 1984. After those initial plays, Wilson's interest evolved from questioning who was missing from history and presenting those voices in his plays to asking how the past gets conjured, particularly for African Americans whose roots in this country go back to the Middle Passage and the transatlantic slave trade, and whose lives have been impacted by slavery's afterlives in the form of Jim Crow, black codes, segregation, and the prison industrial complex. In Joe Turner's Come and Gone, set in 1911, what begins as a living room drama in a boarding house transforms into something more ancient when the characters participate in a juba, a dance form derived from West African call and response rituals. In his next play, The Piano Lesson, set in 1936, the Charles family piano serves as a physical link to a family past that stretches back to when their family were slaves in Mississippi. When Wilson wrote his final five plays, he introduces a singular figure who keeps the cultural memory for Pittsburgh's African-American community. With her name that sounds like the word ancestor, Aunt Esther has been living since 1619, or when Africans were first brought to this country during the transatlantic slave trade. Her memory spans back through Jim Crow, slavery, and the Middle Passage in Africa, and she uses the wisdom gleaned from over 300 years of memory to help guide her community. Aunt Esther first appeared as an offstage character in Wilson's play Two Trains Running, set in 1969. Uh, the play is set in Memphis, Lee, Memphis Lee's Diner, and characters such as Memphis Lee, Holloway, and Sterling, also present in Radio Golf, go to her house located at 1839 Wiley Avenue. 
These characters recount their stories of going up to the house with the red door to get their souls washed. Holloway says simply, she make you right with yourself. Aunt Esther got a power because she got an understanding. Anybody live as long as she has is bound to have an understanding. Her house becomes a sort of symbol in the plays, the site of memory and cleansing. Behind the red door lies the secret to African-American life. Aunt Esther next appears as an offstage force in Wilson's King Henry II, set in 1985. In that play, the Hill's then 366-year-old keeper of memory dies, severing the community's link to their cultural past. Characters in that play like King, Ruby, and Stool Pigeon reminisce about the profound impact that Aunt Esther had on their lives and lament her loss. Stool Pigeon says, Aunt Esther knew all the secrets of life, but that's all gone now. She took all that with her. I don't know what we're going to do now. We in trouble now. Wilson doesn't reveal the full weight of what Aunt Esther means to the Hill District until Gem of the Ocean, which focuses on her story in 1904. In this play, Aunt Esther appears on stage and audiences witness her wisdom and memory in action. Now, although Aunt Esther plays a pivotal role in The Hill throughout Wilson's cycle, in Radio Golf, set in 1997, she has been gone for 12 years. This makes Radio Golf the only play in the cycle that takes place completely in a world without Aunt Esther. It's also the only play in the cycle which focuses on Black folks firmly in the middle class, in the middle class on the cusp of entering Pittsburgh's elite. Harmon Wilkes, the play's central character, is a second-generation real estate developer who is about to announce his candidacy to be Pittsburgh's first black mayor. His wife, Mame, is gunning to be Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania governor's press representative after she helps Harmon win his election. Harmon's best friend from school, Roosevelt Hicks, is about to become a vice president at Mellon Bank, one of Pittsburgh's most successful businesses, and he is looking for ways to further cement his wealth, if for no other reason, so he can play golf as often as he wishes. At the beginning of the play, Harmon and Roosevelt are also finalizing a multi-million dollar redevelopment project that would knock down a large section of the hill to make way for a new condo development called Bedford Hills, complete with a Whole Foods, Starbucks, and a Barnes & Noble. In order for this venture to move forward, however, the city has to declare the Hill District blighted, which means that the area is unsafe or unhealthy for occupancy or is economically unviable. When a government declares blight in an area, it paves the way for the city or redevelopers like Harmond and Roosevelt to purchase the land in that area in some cases in, and in some cases, receive government funding to redevelop the site. In Harmon and Roosevelt's case, they have purchased the land that they need for their Re Bedford Hills project, gotten their plans approved, and procured federal funding for their project as long as the city of Pittsburgh declares the Hill District blighted. Otherwise, their project is in peril. Furthermore, one of the houses on their redevelopment site is 1839 Wiley Avenue. Aunt Esther's home. Over the course of Radio Golf, some characters directly impacted by Aunt Esther come to defend the house from demolition, making the fate of that house a central conflict in the play. Brandon J. Durden, uh, who directed our production of Radio Golf, said in February, this is a play about the struggle over whether we should or have to forget the past in order to move forward. 1839 Wiley becomes the battleground for this question. Like in so many neighborhoods around the country, including locally in Asbury Park and Red Bank, the Hill District faces a crossroads. In Radio Golf, the characters must decide whether they will uh, demolish the past in service of the future, or will they work to find a way for the past, present, and future to live in harmony. Now, when you see or read the play, Try and remember back to how different the world was in 1997. It was a world in which cell phones and the internet were just becoming popular. It was back when 
Burger King was actually still neck and neck with McDonald's. The top five films that year included Titanic, Men in Black, and of course the second Jurassic Park. Number one singles included music by Tony Braxton, uh, Biggie Smalls, who was still alive, The Spice Girls, and Mariah Carey. The Chicago Bulls were in the middle of their second three-piece, something that's unimaginable today, I suppose. And anybody younger than 22 was not even born yet. But one of the more significant changes between 97 and now to keep in mind is that it's way before Barack Obama. Even when Wilson wrote the play in 2005, the idea of a black president or even a black mayor in many cities was more of a vision than a tangible reality. Despite these changes since 1997, look for the way in which these characters engage with ideas of social and political power, racial progress, ambition, and of course that now loaded word, hope. You'll begin to hear subtle resonances to the language that we use today. These discourses are windows into the ways in which America has changed and how much it has remained the same in the past 23 years. I know that I feel lucky to get a chance to experience both the timeless and timely magic that August Wilson left us in all ten of his plays, but particularly in this one, a play written at the end of his time on this earth where he not only completed his life's work, but finished chronicling a hundred years of black life, all the while giving us tools to not just look back, but to move forward. Thank you all. See you all soon.